Hey out there, want to talk about something cool? You came to the right place, Dark Loops. And why is this so good? Welcome to Dark Loops. Why is this so good? A podcast in which scholarly, creative, over-the-top fans get together to discuss something in pop culture that makes them drop to their knees and ask the eternal question, why is this so good? I'm your host, Dr. Scott Jordan, aka Zombie Scotty, cognitive psychologist, philosopher from Illinois State University. And in tonight's episode, we discuss HBO's award-winning series, Westworld. discussion are some amazing HBO Westworld fans. Please introduce yourselves and tell us your favorite HBO Westworld memory. I'm Dr. Marty Lloyd. I'm a forensic psychologist practicing out of Minnesota. I am a contributor to the book Westworld Psychology along with six other books in that series. And my favorite Westworld memory is actually uh, from about two years ago. I, through means I don't think I could even explain, much less understand, ended up a panelist at San Diego Comic-Con on the Science of Westworld panel. It was one of two psychologists, along with uh, stunt coordinators, prop builders, and several contestants from uh, Mythbusters The Search. Again, no idea how it happened, but it was fun. Oh, that's very, very cool. How about you, Leandra? Um, so I'm Leandra Paris. I'm assistant professor of school psychology at William and Mary. And my favorite memory is I remember watching the trailer for season three, and it has Pink Floyd playing in the background. Mm-hmm. And you you see you don't see anything from any of the main Westworld characters. It's just you know Jesse. That, I can't think of him as anything other than Jesse. <laughs> and I just remember thinking like, oh, this is gonna be a really cool new show. It's got Pink Floyd, which that's a whole other podcast the whole thing. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's Westworld. And I was like, oh, you did it. You drew me in and I didn't even know I was already in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> Wind, how about you? Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Wind Goodfriend. I'm a full professor of social psychology at a small liberal arts school in Iowa called Buena Vista University. And um, I also love Westworld, obviously, or I wouldn't be here, but my, one of my favorite memories of Westworld is that um, I got to co-edit the book that Marty mentioned earlier, Westworld Psychology, Violent Delights. And um, I remember the, the person who edits um, most of these books in this pop culture psychology series is, is Travis Langley. He's a, a great guy. And he called me on the phone and asked me if I would co-edit after I had written some chapters for, for some of the other books. And I was so honored and excited, and it meant that I got to really dig deep into all of the chapters in the book, um, which I hadn't done in the other books in the series, so I really enjoyed that. But I also want to say um, one more personal memory that I really enjoyed about, um, from this whole West World um, experience is that when the show was first going to be coming out uh, on HBO, I was talking to my partner and husband, and uh, I said, oh, I've heard of that. And he made me watch the movie from um, oh, okay. way back when with Joel Brenner. And so um, he's the reason that I, I actually got involved in the whole world. Very, very cool. Okay, how about you, Sean? Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Sean Stone. I teach also at Buena Vista University. I'm a full professor of physics and computer science. Uh, yes, I love that 1973 movie. It's one of my favorites. Um, however, I'm Joel Brenner. Yeah, absolutely. But I was very skeptical of them actually building a series off of it. And so my favorite memory is when I realized that this series was going to be a lot different than that 1973, very, you know, ultimately cheesy movie. But um, then I spent seven episodes trying to figure out what the heck I was watching. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It still gets me thinking. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And Sean and I are married to each other, just in case that wasn't really clear. <laughs> All righty then. Tara, how about you? 
I am Tara Rains, and I am an associate professor of school psychology at the University of Denver. Um, my favorite Westworld memories have just been this past season. I did a, a podcast with Scott and Leandra and had a lot of fun and had an excuse to watch each episode multiple mm. times and, and dig in and overthink and make guesses and be wrong. And so it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was a great yeah. experience and a lot, a lot of fun. No, that's fantastic. I have to say that's my favorite memory as well. Um, that was now also I the first. Bad. I should have said that too, but they oh. are definitely my favorite movie. <laughs> memories. We're just we're just... outgrouping you, man. So. <laughs> I know. I feel so bad. I just love Pink Floyd, but I love you guys more. I promise. Uh, okay. So we're going to just, uh, you guys are in this circle on my screen in this way. So we're going to start with Marty. We're going to ask everybody, who's your favorite character with a little bit of why? And, uh, you know, when you pick the wrong one, we're all going to tell you that you were wrong and we'll go from there. So, Marty, who's your favorite character? So, I'm going to go with Maeve uh, because for me, the series really is X-Men and I'm a big comic book guy. Um, but, you know, Maeve is Professor X Del versus Dolores, who is Magneto, basically. And, um, you know, I guess I just kind of root for the good guy and in her own way, kind of, kind of arch way where she doesn't really seem to particularly like anyone. Uh, Maeve is still ultimately the good guy. She's the one that is working for, maybe grudgingly, but working for everyone's best interest. Are you trying to say that uh, that Professor X is the good guy in X Men? Is that what well, you're after? <laughs> he he has his own he has his own motivations. I mean, you know, I think comparatively so he is. No, I, yeah, excellent. There's always shades of gray. And I'm also starting my Maeve count, by the way. So that's Maeve one. How about you, Leandra? So, um, I think I would have said Maeve up until this season. So I'm going to go with the one that's been more consistent for me, which is, and I'm not going to say this correctly, Akachete? They call him... Akacheta. Akacheta. There you go. Sorry, I always say it wrong. Um, I think I just love that we get to see the whole world of Westworld from a completely different perspective, not as one of the heroes or the bad guys, or re just really someone who's been experiencing it as a lived person for a very long time mm -hmm. and has been, I think it was like 10 or plus years without ever dying. Um, and someone who sort of broke through without mm -hmm. it being sort of this revolutionary thing. And he was just trying to do his best to reunite with his people and his love and, and figure out everything. So I felt that I love stories about, you know, the big epic part, but I really get into those side subplots that make it all meaningful. And I feel like mm. that was, that was his storyline. Yeah. I really loved how, you know, what, what we have 17 hours of Westworld back background story for this one character to sort of pop out and really flesh it out uh, in ways. I mean, the only other kind of character I think they could have thrown in was a middle-class American who just suddenly ended up in Westworld and didn't know what was going on. Right, because <laughs> everybody, all the quote unquote humans were just sociopaths, rich sociopaths. So, um, but to have that quote unquote uh, host who uh, who had been out there is really fleshed out the whole world in a great way. Now, I have a great character. How about you? Now is is oh, rich sociopath? Sorry, is rich sociopath redundant? But um, um, in most circles, um, yes. Um, okay, okay. <laughs> just 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 curious there. So. Wind. Well. Maybe I answered, maybe I did the homework wrong. When you said, when, when you asked us about favorite character, I, I started thinking about which character do I find the most interesting, the most fascinating. And so it's not a character I like or admire hey, necessarily, but for hang. me, the most interesting character is William slash Man in Black because mm. he's so psychologically fascinating and we see at least up until maybe the end of season three, what, what appears to be kind of this evolution of evil in a single person and how he continually justifies his actions. So he thinks of himself as the hero. And I think so many historical villains do think of themselves as the hero. They think that they're actually fighting for what's right. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, so it makes us think, you know, what could we potentially do if we were put in the right situation? You know, these social psychology questions that, that always come up in my classes of prejudice and dehumanization of other people and the justification of our own actions um, so that we're kind of coming from a, a place where we're trying to maintain our own power. 
their own privilege probably um, for someone like William, especially, right. but he justifies what he's doing. And so that's the character I find the most psychologically intriguing. So I want to follow up on that because I wonder if one of the cognitive barriers that let's just use the word privileged people create is to find someone to save, right? So in other words, if I can find someone to save, then I can just ignore all the, the wealth and privilege I have that puts me in a position to maybe save someone and I can justify all of it because I'm making that one. I'll just say I was, there was a movie on TV today. I, it's the movie with uh, Sandra Bullock. Uh, Blindside. Blindside, right? Yeah, she goes blindside. and saves someone. Yes. And, of course. That and, and so all hard. the wealth that is yeah. in that character is not even discussed. It's, it's yeah. all about how great she is. Uh, sorry if you guys really like that movie and I just oh, heard no. so I've never no, seen Pat, it. You're absolutely, I mean, so um, two weeks ago, I participated in this week-long um, training called yeah. Academics for Black Lives. And one of the things that they talk about is sort of um, the white savior, basically. Like, so yeah. you're coming from white privilege and you, you love <clears throat> movies like The Blind Side, Hidden Figures, The Help which are on the surface supposed to be telling the story of a person of color, but really white people like them because it's white people feeling like, Oh, I helped. Right. Like, right. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> so I think you're absolutely right. Like if you come from this place of privilege and you kind of know that you're not really that awesome. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to say like all people with privilege are not no, awesome, I but <laughs> I think for William going back to Westworld, William kind of knows he's not awesome. And so he, he takes on this, sort of delusion of himself as as a savior because it helps justify his own actions no i think you're absolutely right i think oh go ahead tara well i was gonna say i think i i for me didn't deeply understand how much of a facade white hat william was until we get to the end of season three mm -hmm. and you see about his childhood right like i it like the whole and, and the whole front half of the series, you think, oh, he had this snapping point in Westworld, and that's when he goes from white hat to black hat, right? Right. And, but in actuality, like, he was so broken when he got there, <laughs> and the white hat William was the facade. Like, that was the, the fake out. Right. And they even set you up, the writers even set you up for that in season three, where he's got the memories of childhood and his dad comes home and he's angry and you think like, oh, he was an abused child and you empathize with him. And then you figure out like, nope, he's still a sociopath. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. So I came from a very poor background and that's, I think that's implied with William that he's always trying to rise above that and get some form of control. Um, against the people that he sees as the enemy, which would be the people with money and with power. And so then he climbs that, uh, you know, that mountain. And my favorite character um, was also William, but I'll, I'll pick another one here in a second. But um, I'm a little more, a bit more sympathetic <laughs> with uh, the early William. I think just like we see with social media, who knew there was so much hate out there when you get into this world you might not even be aware of the depth of your hate i think he's aware of it now especially in season three but i think back then he you know because in that scene where he's in the room with all his cells and he's having to kill all those cells he, he's trying to gain you know some control so for the so let's just say we agree on that and for the trauma specialist in the house would that be diagnostic of post traumatic stress um as opposed to someone undergoing post traumatic growth i remember when we watched that episode with him killing him all his former cells we thought oh okay time for some post traumatic growth here oh nope very next episode he's back now. i got to kill all these hosts right so would that be more indicative of an uh, an outcome of post traumatic stress talking to me <laughs> i'm talking to all the trauma specialists <laughs> i mean i have a lot of problems with william i think that he is a proxy for a lot of things that are wrong in our country right now and it's hard for me to to sort of like step back from that um i think that we know from his flashbacks that he was already 
I think broken, like Tara said, he already had some psychopathology going on there. And so, mm. yeah, sure. It's post-traumatic stress. He was already vulnerable. He already had some things going on in terms of anger and, you know, what have you. Um, but yeah, he definitely didn't grow. <laughs> it just, it didn't, he went right back to who he was before trying to kill people, being violent, using that anger and that white privilege is the only way to act on the world. What are you going to say, Marty? I think with William, what we're seeing is he's going for this illusion of traumatic growth. He wants to see himself as someone who's improving, even though he's not. Mm. And it kind of, I think maybe dovetailing with what Wind was saying earlier, that, you know, we all want to see ourselves as the hero of our own story. And so we want to construct a narrative in which we can play that hero, in which we're sympathetic, not just to other people, but to ourselves. But he's not really growing. I don't know that I'd necessarily call this post-traumatic stress either uh, just because to me that has to do with meeting a very specific set of symptoms and I don't think I necessarily see him showing mm. signs of PTSD per se but um, but yeah no I think he's he's kind of aiming for for growth but in this very unhealthy way and really he just wants to see himself as having grown but he's not really putting the work in so what we see then is Dolores providing him an opportunity, create a narrative for himself that lets him see himself as this growing savior. But then it's Dolores who basically takes that narrative away from him when, when she, he finds out, you know, or when she doesn't remember him, right? So Tara, you, you uh, have something to say. <laughs> So listening to that explanation, I, and I, I don't, I'm sure the writers, I don't know, who knows, I don't think they meant this. But is that not the whole setup that we have seen over the last however many years with like woke white people where they want to see themselves as having done this growth and done this work and people yeah. of color have gone above and beyond <laughs> to facilitate opportunities and have really been carrying the water the whole time? Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just always constantly trying to make ties from the show to... Sure present yeah. moment events and i that just felt like an aha for me like the way you described it i was like i wait, wait i know that person i i know that yeah. person Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. And to take it back to the discussion of movies that we were having before, I mean, you know, when Wind was talking about something like The Blind Side and naming a few others, the thing that kind of occurred to me is there's this formula. You can, it, it's almost, almost a statistical predictor that if you want to know what movie is going to win Best Picture at the Oscars, look for the movie about black people that makes white people feel good about themselves. And, you know, and that's because we are looking for that narrative. We need something we want to just, we want to feel somehow heroic and whatnot. But again, and I think we're seeing this with, you know, what's going on in terms of public health right now. Yeah. A lot of us just really do not want to do the work. Yeah. Right. Well, just to add to that, we're also not, how do I say this the right way? There's work to be done and it's not being organized by people who are in positions to organize it. For me, more so than anything else, the draining of the swamp that was predicted to happen actually has happened. But the swamp that's been drained is the swamp of privilege, right? Everyone has seen what people have been claiming has been going on for years, but there's just enough money running through the system for people not to take time to notice, but now we can't avoid it. Healthcare, education, everything about privilege is being revealed. Okay, how about you, Sean? Go ahead with your favorite character and your take on William. Well, a previous conversation we had, I can't remember if it was recorded, we talked about there's very little comic relief in the series. There's very little, yeah. Except with Lee Sizemore, the writer. Yeah. And he's one of my favorites because of, of that. He's witty, um, <laughs> a little bit outlandish, but he's also one of the characters that grows the most. In fact, you know, I, one of the most surprising moments is when he grabbed the gun and, you know, rushed out mm -hmm. and let Maeve escape, you know, escape. And he gave his life. And that just... Yep. That, that's one of the reasons why he's one of my favorite characters. But he's witty. I love, I love the recursion on that character, too, because he goes out with a B-movie line. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, he's writing a B-movie script and he goes out like a B-movie, you know, hero. Yeah. Um, and that's not to be mean or anything, but it's also as if, well, the only reason 
the reason this is the kind of script this guy could write is because this is the kind of guy he is. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't Ford for sure. But what he was doing was Shakespeare in that setting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Tara? Favorite character? So I love Charlotte. Um, and I, I, I went back and forth. I think I, I said Maeve the first time we did this, but I think by the end of season three, Charlotte's officially my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think she's stunning, and I appreciate the, the early Charlotte that was just really kind of driven and ambitious and could pull off these super sleek outfits with no accessories. I think I even tried it like two or three days at work, and then I was like, no, I need earrings. <laughs> um so i and i i like how even though she's charloris towards the end in, the, in season three i still think we get to see a glimpse of, of charlotte in there kind of you, you get to see a little bit of her her humanity and who she is and so i don't yeah. know i like her i'm happy i'm happy she's around i'm happy she's gonna be a villain, I don't. I, I suppose in the next season, I don't know. I'm excited to see where it takes her. I totally yeah. agree with what you've said. Um, by the way, the first of all, the wardrobe. I wish I had her wardrobe in my life. Like she is fierce. Um, but we do see the real Charlotte in season three, if only um, through that video that she made for her son. Right when she thought she might die, it, that's really insightful into the person she she was, and maybe even hiding a little bit from herself. Yeah. No, oh, that's fantastic. So um, I'm going to say that my favorite character was Ford. Um, and, uh, the, and it's not about me liking Ford. It's me liking how the writers treated that character. Um, here you have someone who's obviously a, a genius, whatever that means, um, capable of creating something we might call consciousness and then recognizing this consciousness that he had been part of creating was simply going to be exploited. Um, even though initially he was doing it to make money, uh, when it got to the point where it was in his face, he recognized that the only way to save what he had created was to teach it how to sustain itself, how to survive. And that meant learning how to kill humans. Um, and I, the whole idea of putting the park into play and having all those tr traumas be stored but hidden and then i'm um, have them all be brought back online 30 years later with reveries and then let it all play out there this is not a person who loves himself and some of the conversations he has with bernard um uh i particularly remember the conversation where they're looking at the michelangelo painting with uh, god in the brain um i absolutely love that conversation and this is not a person that i think I mean, I love it how he tries to create a nobler species, but it's not a pacifist species. And I think there's a sort of, I don't know, realization embedded in who Ford is that, that uh, any system that's going to exist has to sustain itself and reducing that to, to right and wrong. He's, it, there's this contradiction. He wants to create a better species, but he knows that it has to be a killer just you know, like any other species. So. I just like the way they carried that out and I, I love the actor and I thought it just gave an anchoring to everybody else's what the other characters could do, how they could grow, what they could explore. Um, that I, I just appreciated that kind of heft uh, in the, the origin story of Westworld. So any comments on Ford or? All right, I, then. go ahead. No, he's, he's a fascinating guy. I mean, I was a theater major in school too, so all of his references to you know mm. Shakespeare and all that kind of stuff. Um, the writing of Ford, I thought, was particularly brilliant. Yeah, I, yeah, and that'll lead to my favorite scene later. So let's talk about um, at the moment. I have on the list favorite episodes. Let's go ahead and start with Leandra. What was your favorite episode? Um, so it's actually, I'm sure you guys all feel this way. It's really hard. Like I feel like I have lots of favorite scenes, but they're not all in the same episodes. <laughs> So, but um, the one episode that I always kind of rewatch whenever I'm in the mood is the Akani no Mei, so Akani's Dance, where we are introduced to Shogun World. I just remember watching it and being like, oh my gosh, these guys are so lazy. They didn't even come up with like a different story for the people to experience. And then just watching Maeve and Hector meet their doppelgangers and kind of seeing 
to them, it's not just, you know, a lazy story that's being repeated in a different world. It's watching someone else living a very similar life and Akane trying to protect his daughter, which Maeve ultimately ends up trying to do. And so I just saw, and also just hearing Paint It Black, <laughs> like completely mm. redone for that mm. episode. Like I love the music and I think this was a time where the music and the storytelling and the parallel between what's happening in the West world versus what's happening to the host. And then the real people who are writing for West world, um, it was just really well laid out and it was just interesting. So I wouldn't call it like the most like aha moment of the entire uh, series, but it definitely was beautifully done and entertaining and just very enlightening for a lot of other different reasons that we could spend a whole podcast on. No, that's cool because by seeing that same story told in a different context, it makes you experience Westworld differently, right? Oh yeah, this is all prefab. I mean, you know, even though you knew it was constructed, seeing that same narrative play out on a different space even makes you feel it, like it's more of a product uh, than you initially right. experienced it, right? And, and they're being know. played with, and I think it reminded me a lot of, um, in Steve, one of Stephen King's novels, one of the characters says, go then, there's other world than these. And it just reminds you that Westworld mm. is actually only one piece yeah. of a broad theme park, and there are lots of other theme parks where people are having their lives messed around with in the same way that Maeve and Hector are. So mm. um, it was just enlightening and it was just a really fun, pretty musical insight into another side of this theme park that we don't actually get to see a lot about. Right. Uh, Sean, what's your favorite episode? My favorite episode is from season one. Um, it's, I'm not, I can't pronounce French very well, but I'll try. Uh, Trump Leo L. Mm, mm -hmm. And the phrase actually refers to a French artist movement where you take just ordinary things and you array them together. And from far back, they look like something else. Like you can make mm, you know, mm -mm, paintings mm -hmm. of the masters from people, things you get from the garbage. But when you look closer, there's, it's something else. And so that's the uh, episode that Bernard has revealed to be um, mm. a host. And th that really blew my mind. That's when everything started coming together. Um, and that he actually was responsible for killing uh, people. Because yeah. you know, at that point, I think we were still not to the level that they were killing people. That was in the very last episode. Is that the episode where he said, what wall or what door? Maybe it wasn't, I don't know. But... The, the scene where Bernard goes, what door? That that was like... Yeah, yes, um, I think... Yeah. No, that was uh, the, the episode before. Oh, okay. Um, right. So they're programmed not to not notice those things, right? right. Things that... Right. Um, so, but... I've been a fan of AI since I was... I could, you know, first watch mm -hmm. TV. I had read Omni Magazine. There was lots of AI articles in that. And so... This is the first se uh, series other than um, Blade Runner, uh, the movie, that really gets it right in my mind. So, the, yeah, we'll, we'll stick on AI for a second, because one of the interesting things is here we are watching a movie and we believe that some of them are non-human. They're all being acted by humans, but we still go through this moment where we experience uh, a, an android who is human or an, an or an android who or a human who's android and we do have this cognitive flip it does make us think about them differently which uh, i don't know if that means we dehumanize them you know I'm, I'm not sure but um do you think they handled the ai or the depiction of ai well they do it very well um the hierarchies that they show like you know they flash and they're manipulating their hierarchies and uh when Maeve was speaking and she was watching those phrases be chosen mm -hmm. it, it is it is trees after trees after trees after trees like that mm -hmm. and um i was very impressed with that they had done their research for sure yeah it was really stunning tara favorite episode so i was talking to leandra about this i don't have a favorite episode that's okay i, had, that's I really okay. really struggled with this with with picking it apart and like just thinking like Okay, I like this one, and I'm like, eh, but that part of this other one was better than that right. one. So I guess if I had to pick a favorite, it would be, what is it, Kiksuya? Is that the one that's all about, um, it's like yes. a totally different story altogether? Like it doesn't, yes. I mean, that's... it does 
fold in, but it's like mm-hmm. not. I well, no, I'll I don't have jump, a favorite. I'll just say I don't I'll, have a favorite. I'll just jump in that conversation with you because um, Kiksuya is my favorite episode by far. Excellent. That was a great setup. Um, now, it, it, it's not really standalone because it, it doesn't work if you don't have 17 hours of Westworld ahead of it for it to lean into. But man, the way they were able to capture an Air, American Indian mythology and put it into the live life of a, of a host. And he's, you know, his narrative about going to hell or going to the underworld to retrieve his family. And, and he goes to this place that for him is the underworld. I talk about doing your homework and, and, um, and then capturing it well in terms of what it would feel like to be that type of a person in, in that context and seeing people that didn't look the same and then you go to this place and you get yourself killed to go there so that you can find these people i mean that's that's what we would call mythology right and i i just thought it was stunningly well done um i have to admit i cry a little bit every time i watch it just because you know when he sees these people when he sees her in hell right? And she can't kiss him back. I'm sorry, but that hurts. <laughs> I mean, that's just, and it's so well acted and it's so meaningful. So no, that's by far uh, my favorite episode. Again, it can't stand alone because you need all that other stuff there to make it uh, have something to lean, lean into. But uh, Marty, how about your favorite episode? I'll join the train of, I don't really have a favorite episode because they all kind of bleed together. And yeah, sure. I'm definitely the one here who's I, I don't remember episode names. Yeah, I'm lucky yeah. if I remember character names, to be honest. But um, but for me, I think if I had to pick an episode, I'm going to go, and again, don't know episode names, but I'm going to go with the season one finale. Uh, because mm. for me, that's kind of what brought home, okay, it was that moment of revelation of, here's what's going on. And there was a lot of speculation that maybe mm. there were multiple timelines and whatnot, but there's where you start to get confirmation. And mm even if you suspected on some level or were guessing that, you know, William was the man in black, just seeing that, you know, made clear, kind of made canon mm-hmm. at that point is, is a major revelation. And, you know, it's, if you've guessed some of that stuff going in, you feel great about yourself. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you have that, right. from, but just um, from a narrative point of view, like, okay, so this is what's been going on. And then, okay, so where do they go? now it's you know right. that was um uh so i really liked how that brought kind of all the threads together from season one i think that was you know it, it was an impressive thing to pull off so when dolores shoots forward and it's like oh my god oh my god but then this next season we see that he has a, a pearl what happened to your thoughts about ford when you find out he had a safety soul Right. I mean, on the one hand, there was this kind of bizarre Shakespearean nobility and and, you know, having God die so that his children could work on their own. Uh, At the same time, no, yo, I got a safety pearl right here and I'm not leaving. Um, Did did you did your thinking about anybody, all of you, did you thinking about Ford change when you saw he had a safety ball? Yeah, he has a horcrux, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he's not going anywhere. So, but, you know, Sean and I, we watched that episode together, and, and we both thought the person that Dolores shot, we thought was a copy of Ford, right? The real mm. human Ford is, like, hiding somewhere, like, watching. Right. So I keep hope, but we haven't actually seen that. So I don't know if that hypothesis is valid, but I keep hoping, like, season four, like, biological Ford is going to come out of the woodwork or something. We'll just so call that I, I would love that. Right? Plus yeah, we get to see yeah. Anthony Hopkins again. It'd be a way to get him back into the series for sure. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, he did appear in the series as his, well, not his avatar, but his propagated soul. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he realized that in order to reach the goal that he was going for, it would take a little bit more shepherding than his physical self. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm with you on that. The thing is, he created, you know, we have Dolores, Maeve, and Bernard, right, who are all set up to sort of compete or go against each other or something in season three. So he's got his children set up to continue his own personal internal struggles, right? 
So um, I, I kind of wish he hadn't had a pearl. I'll just be honest with you. I kind of wish that he had said, you know, I'm after a no, I'm after a nobler species, but you know what? I've done all my rationalizations, and basically, life is very difficult. Life is struggle, and you can't let yourself get taken down. And um, so I'm gonna get out of the way. But anyway, I, I I appreciated the final episode, like you mentioned, and then when he came back in a pearl, eh, okay, okay, we all have a soul. Um, who haven't? Someone want to say something? Go ahead. I thought someone was gonna say something. No, I was just gonna say that it's no longer a sacrifice at that point, and I think that's what mm. you really wanted to see. Just knowing you, Scott, like, I feel like the idea of him sacrificing himself for the greater goal of his creation. Mm. You know, yeah. and then the fact that he has a pearl it's no longer a sacrifice. It's just one more piece in a longer puzzle. And it, it's kind of interesting. So we spent a lot of time talking about the religious aspect of that and how, you know, Dolores is always talking about God and who that is. And is that forward for her? And, you know, if he doesn't sacrifice himself, that doesn't sit with the mythology that most of us are kind of following with that Catholicism that was through the last season. So I think it's just, that's my thoughts as you were yeah. saying that. See, yeah. I would argue that if Dolores has a human God, it would be Arnold not Ford. And Arnold did yeah, sacrifice. That's good. Yeah, that is true. He did. Yeah, given the story we've been told, Arnold did take, Arnold did die, and it's Ford who rebuilt him, mm -hmm. right? And, and then Dolores coached him into consciousness, if I remember, as they were building him. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. So Ford actually remade God in a false image, so Ford would be... <laughs> there you go. The Antichrist? I don't know. I don't know how you're going to like do that. You're going to follow that through, but no, I, there's a lot well, of shaking your head. Like, y'all went way down a hole. Like, you're the one who got me on the Catholicism thing, Tara. Don't shake your head. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> if we also, want. Can you, guys, can you hear my fan? It's we're in the middle of a heat wave and our, our AC can't keep up. So I can't hear your fan. Okay, good. Because I'm sweating and I really I don't want to turn it off. So I changed my order so I wasn't having the same person first and last every time, but I forgot who I've not asked about favorite episodes. So who have I not asked about a favorite episode? Okay, when you go ahead. What's your favorite episode? Well, I'm going to say an episode that I like, not because of the episode itself, but maybe the placement in the show. So I like the first episode of season three. Not necessarily because of what actually happens in the episode, but because it's the first episode where we see them in our world. Mm -hmm. And um, so for me, it has the most potential of any episode because season one and two is all about how do we get out of the park. And mm -hmm. so for season three, I really like the idea that, okay, these people who have been oppressed, right? I think of this as, you know, a metaphor of, any social group that's been oppressed over time, right? right? And they now have sort of been empowered and, and given liberty. And so what are they going to do with it? And how are they going to, you know, right. kind of get revenge, basically? So mm -hmm. I like the potential of the episode. I'm not sure that season three lives up to the potential that no. I necessarily wanted. Um, but I like that episode because it's the most exciting to me. Like, okay, what are they going to do? And for me also... Um, as a feminist scholar, I really like that, you know, maybe I'm a little bit slow here, but season three at the beginning, I finally sort of realized this series is one of the only ones I know where the three main badasses are all women. So I really appreciate, we have Dolores, we have Maeve, we have Charlotte. These are three empowered, strong women. And I can't think of another show where women are portrayed in this much right. of a hero role. I mean, even if you think about movies like Kill Bill, which has a lot of badass women, they all answer to Bill, basically, right? right? No, you're so, right. So for me, season three really made that salient in a way that I didn't perceive in seasons one and two as much. And so I, I just appreciated, you know, what happens when you give people who have been oppressed for years and years and years the opportunity to take back that control. And I, I find that exciting. You know, I think that maybe you may have explained why I was a little let down with, with uh, Ford's uh, soul pearl. Um, no, man, let him go and let him be in power and let him figure it out. Um, what I really like about the three characters you mentioned is they were all complex. Sometimes they were allied with each other. Sometimes they were fighting with each other because they all had their own world to live. And uh, that, that I did appreciate. 
What did Maeve do in episode one of season three? Was that the, um, were they, did they, what was her? What yeah, was you're that? right. She doesn't really come in until season two, or I mean, sorry, episode two of season three, um, where so, they see her in War World. So Maeve was, was kind of missing from that episode, which is um, the only downfall to my argument. You have pointed it out very well. No, there's no downfall. <laughs> I mean, when we were podcasting it, we were all somewhat disappointed at the sacrifice of Maeve's character development in the name of the development of others. Tara, you wanted to... Yeah, the whole season, and I, but I think we knew, we anticipated her coming in as a badass, right? Because she had been the savior yeah. at the end of season two. So even yeah. though she wasn't physically present, like we were just kind of waiting for That's them true. to bring her in. That's and I do think the post credit scene was her in, in the tower waking up, right? You're right, yeah. She was in the so, post credit scene. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, was, Leandra. I'm and here for you. Nazi town? Nazi yeah. world? Okay. War world. War world. Because <laughs> they use it later to train actual soldiers, right? So They do. Know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, let's move on to, we call it favorite scene or favorite moment, right? Uh, just some event that happened in the show that uh, really stuck with all of you. And this time we'll start with Sean. I have a lot of favorite scenes. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm just going to take the most recent. When Sarak and Maeve are in Singapore, and you know she's joking with him that she wished she would have brought her to Paris. And then all of a sudden the look on his face, I mean the actor, I can't remember the actor's name, but it was just amazing. Just the look of pain in, in his face. <laughs> and then recounts what happens to Paris. Mm. You know, the motivations of the characters matter to me a lot. Mm -hmm. and to see this, I, I could see how someone would want to prevent that kind of pain. Cause that, I think that was his initial motivation of, of creating uh, what is it? Robohan? Is that yeah, how you controllable say? world? Controllable. Right. Um, well, absolutely. One free of outliers. Yeah. And which is statistically um, impossible by the way. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> Every distribution has outliers. <laughs> Sorry. That's about what that. They, that, that, they discover that that's the, the downfall <laughs> of their machine. Exactly. exactly. But, um, when they cut to him and, you know, the actual tears coming out of, you know, the welling mm -hmm. up in his eyes, I just, I also kind of cried during mm. that particular scene. There you it go. Just, well, I, they I know I'm supposed to hate the bad guys, but everybody well, has an arc and it was yeah. nice to see that part of him. Well, that's one thing you don't see in this show and I wouldn't mind chatting about it with you guys for a bit is there are no traumatized characters there are no non-traumatized characters right well, are there I, any I, characters I, that make anything happen in the show who don't have a traumatized backstory okay i'm gonna go back to william because earlier we were talking about william and does he have ptsd i'm gonna kind of call bs on that a little bit because i don't think you get to claim ptsd if you're the one causing the trauma right like no. as far as we can tell he hasn't actually been the victim of really any trauma in his life. He's the cause of the trauma. Yeah. No, he, I mean, they, as you said in that episode in season three, they set it up such that such you look at it and say, oh, his father was so horrible to him. And then you recognize, well, yeah, but there are some sociopathic tendencies there, uh, mm -hmm. regardless of the father. So, you know, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And even his whole like flip with Dolores, like she can't help that she got reset and he's made it out as though he was the victim of some sort of mm. trick or it's been traumatizing for him. Like, no, she just exposed what was already there and your facade can't live up to it anymore. Like she broke your ego. You know what I mean? Like it's right. great. Point. And he's haunted by his daughter and he, his wife committed suicide in the bathroom. And, and there's a, there's a line where he says like, well, I don't use that room. That's mm. like your big life changes that you have to shave in front of a different mirror. Like it's not, I'm not <laughs> feeling sorry for you. No, you're absolutely right. And so what you do see is something that you do see in the real world and it's arguing over who gets to wear the veil of victimhood, right? And so people are sort of trying to compare their traumas and quantify them or scale them. And you, you see that particularly in people who, people who are being challenged on their privilege um, well, come up with, suddenly come up with stories that, well, I've been traumatized as well, or I had a difficult past as well. And, and or I'm uh, a stable genius. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that's the thing. It's, it's not PTSD. It's narcissism with him. I mean, that's the driving force with William. Right. Exactly. Um, um, okay, then. Let's go to Tara. Favorite scene. Uh, and you guys can go ahead and like riff off a couple of, you know, I like this one, I like this one, but this is the one that I really, really would talk about at a bar. I don't know. Okay. And I, 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 I hate being so indecisive with all of these. So I was just hoping to give a lot of input on, on, on what you all <laughs> chose and just kind of be the piggybacker in the meeting. Um, but I, if I had to choose one scene that was my all-time favorite scene it would have to be um it would have to be the scene with Maeve and the two technicians mm. when they realize she's alive and they're kind of navigating that whole because I don't know because to me I guess she'd always had this humanity and so to see them finally see her humanity and then be scared to death by that. I don't know that, that whole scene, you all talk mm -hmm. when we talked about this before, like there are lots of things in it that tickled me that everyone's right. like, this is so dark. And I'm like, but that's, it's, I don't know. I thought, no, that I that thought that that's a great me. scene. And it's another oh. scene where these human actors are suddenly acting as if they're seeing a human actor who they thought was a host is actually a human and, and it's being acted brilliantly. Um, and when he thinks he's a host, when, and she's yes. like, no, darling, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can do uh, Maeve, Maeve quotes anytime. She's fantastic. Um, Marty, favorite scene? Well, maybe not such a serious answer, but uh, the scene that I think of that brought me just the most utter joy was in season three when we cut, when we're, you know, behind scenes at the park. And we see the showrunners from Game of Thrones as technicians <laughs> and working on the robot dragon. And it's like and, something like, and something like Game of Thrones makes so much sense as one of the parks. I'm like, yeah, that's why there's so much nudity and sex. It's, you know, the violence is over the top. And it's like, like I, I buy this in some way. But it's... Well, uh, the, the thing is there, that's a great cover story for season eight of Game of Thrones, right? <laughs> they could say it was written by Lee Sizemore. And it's there you go. Fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> everything makes sense it's all i think if i had to give a more serious answer though it would be thinking and i'm probably gonna not explain the scene well but uh there's toward the end of season two i don't remember if it was the finale or shortly before that uh but you know where the robots are essentially the hosts are getting ready to go to what amounts to robot heaven. You know, they have to cross mm -hmm. that threshold for that to happen. And basically, uh, suddenly Clementine is basically sent in as this weapon to be used against them. And she's been essentially lobotomized at that mm -hmm. point, which is why Clementine, I think, is about the most tragic of the characters in the show. Mm. Um, because she was, from what I recall, she had that moment where maybe she could have had a similar evolution to Maeve and they just took that away from her and then turn mm. her on everyone else. Mm. Um, you know, and that was, I mean, there's something just so, so very sad about them using her um, to wreak havoc on her kind. And that's it's evil, right? Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and also just as a forensic psychologist, I mean, it's one, I kind of watched like with everything the hosts do, do any of them have a valid insanity defense? And yes, yeah, she does. She, you know, because yes. she's not in control of her actions at that point right. and yeah. probably not aware. Teddy does too, but only for the things he does after Dolores uh, changes his personality. But that's mm. a whole other thing. Uh, Wind, favorite scene? I think my favorite single scene out of the many wonderful scenes is um, maybe halfway through season one when William and Dolores are being attacked and Dolores shoots the gun for the very first time. She has this awesome line. I imagined a story where I didn't have to be the damsel. And mm. it's, it, for me, it's kind of this, again, it's kind of like a feminist awakening and the idea that you can write your own story and you don't have to listen to the people who have told you this is who we want you to be. You can be who you want to be. That's fantastic. And she does it with emphasis. All right, I mean, it's just very, very clear at that point. Um, my favorite scene is um, from the Kiksuya episode, and it's when uh, Akacheta walks up on Ford in the middle of the night, cutting the scalps 
off of other members of the ghost tribe. What's that? The ghost, ghost nation. nation. Ghost Nation. Um, to remove the maze imprints that uh, Akichetta's guys have been putting, uh, to, you know, they, they've been basically scalping themselves, carving this into their scalp, and then putting it back on. And the guys in the tech room aren't noticing it because they're not taking their scalps off. And suddenly Ford recognizes this is going on. So he's out for some reason doing all this work by himself in the middle of the night. And they just have for me, for me, the conversation, you know, it's like, you know, the, the conversation uh, of Westworld. And I'll talk about that when we get to my favorite line, but just uh, Ford's reaction to finding a creature that's actually what he tried to create. This, I put an AI out there, but I've been controlling them and taking their memories away for 30 years. Uh, here's one that just got lost out there, and this is what I was trying to create. And, and um, Akichetta can't understand what's going on. For Akichetta, the, the, creator, the destroyer is Dolores, right? And um, I think Ford says some, to him something like, when the destroyer comes again, just get ready to take your people some, to the other land. And it's like, it's just this beautiful moment where Ford knows, kind of has a sense of where this guy is and, and he's getting him ready to go off to heaven. Um, and I, for me, that was just like two worlds clashing um, in, in a very beautiful poetic way. I absolutely love that scene. Do you think that Ford was having second thoughts and that's why he was out there doing the scalping? Because if he would have told the technicians, like, listen, this is happening, they yeah. would have shut the whole thing down, right? Yeah, that's a so great question. Because before I even said what my favorite scene was, I was thinking, well, maybe we should talk about why the hell Ford's out there cutting scalps and yeah. getting rid of the maze. Why does yeah. that matter? It, is it messing with Westworld? Um, what? Or maybe he didn't even, I mean, maybe he didn't know why it was there. Um, so I don't well, know why. I don't know. Do you, I, I guess my, my question is maybe he was like, I want them to come to their own consciousness, but maybe not. Like maybe he was like, mm. this could end poorly for them. So let me save them by getting rid of these mazes. Well, I think that the timeline of when that occurred was, was way before season one started. Right. Right. So it's before Ford has decided to help the hosts. Okay. Okay, because he. But wasn't his ultimate there. goal, though, for them to gain their own consciousness? On I, think their that own? Was Arnold, I think that was Arnold's goal, but I don't think that was Ford's goal. Uh, okay, okay. I, right. think, well, I, I don't remember what episode it was, but there was a scene where he admits that he's continuing Arnold's dream. Got right, it. but that's, that's after the scene with the scalps, right? So I think my argument mm. is. You know, as as he's remembering that scene, it's out of time. It's not in season one. It's a prequel right. to mm. season one. Well, I, what I what I do like about whether what was Ford and Ford's intention is that Ford and Arnold both eventually realize these beings are conscious, and they have dramatically different responses. Right? Arnold basically has Dolores go around and kill them all. Um, so that they can't be replaced and that Ford can't do what he wants with them. Ford says, no, I'm going to train these things how to take care of themselves. And to do that, they have to be willing to kill humans. And so he opens a park, but for a different reason than to make money, he opens a park to basically allow humans to come in and dare I say, traumatize these beings so they can learn how to exist outside of the park. So, you know, I, I still don't know what Ford was doing. I, I, it's more like he was out there as a forensic anthropologist trying to figure out why the hell are they carving mazes into their skulls? <laughs> what is this? You know, I don't know that he had an answer. And I think meeting Akacheka that, Akacheta that night kind of answered a question for him, took him off guard a little bit. And uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. That, that scene for me was just boom. Um, it was, it was just pure poetry, I'd say, and I, I loved it. Um, I've not, there's someone I've not asked about a favorite scene. Is that Leandra? Have I not uh, asked you about a favorite scene? Yeah, I didn't do mine. Um, so I actually had two that were kind of tied and they both involved Bernard, so I'm gonna stick them together. Um, one was when Stubbs is basically like, 
all right, get your boat. It's in season three. He's like, okay, get your boat. Like, I'm going to go kill myself now. And Bernard's right. like, yeah, no, you're not going to do that. Like, I love that moment where, like, Bernard just continually shows us what it means to actually be human and to recognize that, mm. like, person needs purpose and I don't want him to go. And so right. kind of giving him exactly what Stubbs needs in that moment. Now, whether or not you agree with, like, stopping someone who truly wants to go, that's a whole other thing. But I feel like it was just a touching moment where I felt like he gave him back that purpose. And it kind of ties into the other scene that was really touching for me, which is when um, Bernard meets Arthur's wife and the Mm. amazing Gina Torres sits there and talks about what it means to heal and how it doesn't go away, but you carry them with you and, and sort of says like, you know, our son is with you too. And I know we talked about whether or not like she recognizes this, this is a, you know, Arthur and, um, and all of that, mm. but I felt like it said a lot about Bernard that that centered him. He was so sure after that meeting, and he seemed much more in control and confident what he was doing. And also a lot about Dolores that she gave him that gift in the yeah. end. And I just felt like that was just a she beautiful. Did. It said a lot about a lot of characters that weren't there. No, that's really and Gina Torres is great, and she's beautiful, and she did an amazing job. And just the whole message was was really great about healing and and all of that. So, so go ahead, Gwen. I interpreted the first scene you described in a totally different way, which I think is interesting. Um, it sounds like your interpretation of the scene was Bernard sort of saving Stubbs and being kind to him and letting him, sort of preventing him from committing android suicide, I think. <laughs> My interpretation of that scene was, um, I need you to help me, so I don't care what you want. I'm going to program you to be my servant. And so yeah, I believe it to be a very other, selfish thing. Right. And I think that was, I think I actually kind of like that it's ambiguous. Like I read it and I put myself in that situation. Like my motivation would have been, mm. I don't want you to leave. And I think that you just need purpose, but that's actually really arrogant of me to assume that you need purpose. And this isn't, you know what I mean? Like, and that yeah. I could be your purpose. So I think that's, I think that's why I actually love the moment too, because you're absolutely right. I talked to other people where they were like, no, that was selfish. Like he was done. <laughs> he was ready to go. He felt like he had served his purpose. Um, so yeah. I, actually, I really do agree with you. I think it's just, it's so interesting. So the scene you mentioned with um, Bernard meeting Arnold's wife, question for, the, for all of you. Did you experience that as, um, oh, Arnold's wife is real? Because I thought Arnold's wife had been a fabrication when we found out that Bernard was a host, I thought the whole backstory had been fabricated. His son, um, his wife. And for me, so there was this double whammy of, as Leandra said, seeing this great relationship and what it did for Bernard. But then it's like, oh my God, th- those people were quote unquote real, whatever that means. And and he really did have that whole life. I don't know, there was that layer for me that wasn't there for some people because they all knew it wasn't a fake backstory. So what was your reaction? I guess I wasn't necessarily surprised by it. I wouldn't go as far as to say I saw it coming, but mm. the whole goal in creating Bernard is to sort of recreate Arnold. So, I mean, it's not, I guess, a huge shock that they would have been using significant elements of Arnold's life to do that. So I guess I wasn't maybe blown away by that, but. Mm. No, I Same just remember there. having. I, I assumed it was something that really happened to Arnold and they were mm. doing again for Bernard. Gotcha. Also, really quickly, I just realized I kept calling him author because it's really hot here. It was Arnold that I kept meaning to say. And I, every time I said it, I knew something was wrong and I couldn't figure out why. Just it's a McGurk effect. I heard you say Arnold. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you say Arnold, too. Oh, uh, see, so shouldn't have said anything, but yeah. Cool. Then we'll move on to favorite line. Um, I'll just ask you to volunteer. You know, some of you may not have lines. I don't know. Um, so who has a favorite line? Sean, go ahead. I'm only volunteering to be first because it is that scene with Bernard and uh, Arnold's wife. I almost said Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, You've been primed. The reason I really love that scene and the quote from the scene um, is because ever since season one, Arnold's been carrying the pain of his son with him. Mm-hmm. And he, then he, he, he comes to find out he's a host and that's not his memory. But the Mm -hmm. thing is, it is his memory and he feels it and he experiences it and he thinks it makes him, 
you know, weaker, I guess you could say. So he has the sense that he needs to eradicate this thing because it's not of him. But in that moment, when she talks about um, saying, that's ridiculous, <laughs> you don't forget the people you love. That's just completely right. ridiculous. And talking about her fight of running from the, my quote is, when you, running from the darkness um, towards the light, that's what that memory of her son gives her. Because he's gone, but they're not gone. And so he's not really gone. He right. lives on in, in them, in their memory. Mm, and that he brings the light with her. And I thought that was beautiful, absolutely beautiful moment and scene. But again, I think that also gives Bernard permission, I mean, yes. and realization that that's part of him. I think he becomes whole um, in that scene. And that's, that's, that's a, a fantastic insight. And when you look at that scene, he's becoming whole with, with another person. So, you know, it's basically saying we don't get whole by ourselves. And it's not a mistake that it's his wife who provides him that space to suffer right um and to express his suffering whereas he's not been around anybody who said hey bernard how are you really feeling today he's, he's just not been in around anybody he's not been around anyone like that and mm -hmm. so when you get used to no one asking you how you feel and you're not provided a space to suffer i had to suspect that has long-term consequences um for not being able to disclose your suffering who else has a line yeah wind Go ahead, Wind, and then we'll go to Marty. Well, one of the great things about Westworld is the, the writing. There are so many lines that just hit you. Um, one of the benefits of editing the book on Westworld was each chapter starts with a quotation from the mm. show. And, and so, you know, there were so many good choices. Um, and many of the most beautiful lines are these kind of philosophical lines about free will or, or who do you <laughs> yeah. want to be or things like that. But all that said... My favorite line so far is the two word sentence, what door, which mm. you referred to earlier, um, because that tiny sentence just blew my mind. I was like, oh, no, he's a host. Like, yeah, he's the <laughs> my whole, like. like the whole paradigm shift of the show. Um, so for me, that that's, again, beautiful writing because you can say so much in two words. And when he said that line, who was he with? Was uh, he with um, the, woman? the woman he was about to kill. I forget her name. I forget. Her right. Name. Because what's what what was cool is like you said that what door and I don't even think she really noticed what. She, no. Did, right. And we're like, oh my god! And then she does another. I just yeah, because he's kind of looking the other direction, and yeah. she might have thought like, oh, he just doesn't exactly. really know know what door I'm talking about because there are lots of doors. Yeah. So I don't think she clicked it. And you know, it's a good line when it becomes a meme, right? I mean, you say to someone, what door, and you know what they mean, right? Marty, how about your favorite line? Well, my favorite line is a bit of a cheat because it's used heavily in a lot of the marketing for the show. But mm. I have to go with, you know, these violent delights have violent ends. Mm. And it's because of the way it subverts the original meaning of the quote, because it's from Romeo and Juliet, and there, violent means sudden. You know, it basically mm. has to do with, well, young love that, you know, starts suddenly uh, is probably going to fade away pretty quickly as well. You know, it's these things are transient and passing. But then in the show, they give it this more, they give violent its literal meaning and mm. kind of really talks about, you know, that this is, there is ultimately this comeuppance that, you know, that uh, yes. the human guests of the park are bringing their fate on themselves yep. because they choose to delight in, you know, these kind of doing these horrible things. And that's going to have consequences. Yeah. Plus the line just sounds cool. So oh, you know. it is cool. So cool. It made it as a subtitle of a book, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who else has a favorite line? Um, so yeah, go ahead, Tara. Okay. Go ahead, Tara. I'll go. My, um, the line I liked was, um, it was, it was two lines. It's that exchange between Dolores and Charloris. Mm. um on the bed and and it's when mm. you don't know who's inside Charloris and and she says like w you know like what will I do if you leave and Dolores is like you'll survive mm. and they're like cuddled up and to me I don't know like the whole show has been about the host surviving and 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 so that line for me and by that line for me just really 
it in cap. I don't know. I, I had practiced this and, and now I'm losing. <laughs> um, that line for me, I'm getting tired. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. That line for me, it just really captured the essence of, of what you think at that time Dolores's motivation is, right? It's for her species and her, right. I don't know, humanity to survive. I don't know. And, and don't the, the sort of self-care it's going to take to survive, you know, in yeah. this space where they're fighting for their survival. Um, yeah. When I, the chapter I contributed to that book was called Finding Yourself in a World Made for Suffering. Um, mm. And um, the, the, the parallels to our life are, of course, just straightforward, right? You've got to maintain some self-care um, because it's just not going to stop. The world's not going to stop. Um, when Sean and I watched that scene, um, we actually discussed who whose pearl is inside of mm. Charlotte, right? Mm -hmm. And our guess was that it was Teddy. Yes, that was so did my we. Guess. Yeah. <laughs> I was righteous about it. I knew it was Teddy. Yeah. I knew it. Oh my God. We yeah. were so was confident so it was it. Teddy. We practically bought stock in yes. yeah. Teddy's and pearl. And then we came back for the next episode, and Tara's like, I can eat my crow. It's fine. I'm fine with it. <laughs> Because it was so cool when you found out that, you know, yeah. there's a variant on Dolores. No, I absolutely love it. And it's very insightful into Dolores' character because she yes. keeps saying, well, who, who else could I trust? She only trusts herself and maybe a little bit of Bernard because she gives him the encryption key, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, but, it, you know, the vulnerability and thinking about it being Dolores and Dolores, like, right. I don't know. I think it's, again, it's more humanity. It's, it's, it's the imposter syndrome. It's something that so many... Mm. So many of us, you know, grapple with like, what's going to happen if you're not here? Like, you're the powerful face of who I am, you know? And then we get to see that, I don't know, the, the Dolores that was weak and curled up in the bed becomes the more powerful Dolores at the end of this. Yeah. yeah. And how many of our personal decisions to indulge in self-care emerge from an internal dialogue with ourself? Right, dude, you're not taking care of yourself, man. You have got to stop this, stop looking at Facebook, stop, you, you have got, <laughs> and, and I'm like, we're talking to myself, but that's exactly the case, right? And they actually sort of embodied that in the two of them. That's fantastic. Um, who else had a line? Uh, I did. Go ahead. So mine was actually, I don't remember what season or episode it was, but it's when Bernard is taking, or maybe it's Arnold at this point, um, must have been Arnold that to Dolores to the, the real world. And he's kind of showing it to her and trying to see how she's gonna react. And they're having this conversation. And at one point she says, a strange new light can be just as frightening as the dark. And I don't know why that, I've, I've actually remember like rewinding it and kind of rewatching it and just kind of being like, that's really insightful because when we're working with other people, like we just can never understand, like, why don't you just change? Why don't you just leave? Yes. Why don't you just move on? Why don't you just cope? Not realizing that, taking on that new normal, taking on, even if it's healthy, like what you don't know, what doesn't, you know, feel familiar is actually really, really scary. It takes a lot of courage to do that. And so, you know, especially later when it comes to the great Valley beyond and this new light and, you know, you have to make a choice. Are you going to stay here? Or are you going to risk it to go? And of course, you know, you should go, but um, I just felt like that was really insightful for her to kind of say, like, you're showing me all these things, but I'm just, this, this is just as scary as staying in the dark. No, that's, that's fantastic insight. I mean, once your unconscious assumptions don't work, it's just terrifying, right? Yeah. So, so uh, my favorite line is tied up with my favorite episode, my favorite scene. It, it's a line that Ford says to um, Akicheta. He says, uh, all this time you've been a flower growing in the darkness. I love that line because... It, Ford doesn't say it to judge him as good or bad. It's 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 almost like some some of Darwinian, right? In the sense that you kept yourself going in this space that's beautifully ugly. You fell in love. You lost love, and that's what Ford's trying to create. And to have Ford be outthought by circumstance, right? Ford has always thought, I'm ahead of the world. But in fact, no, you're bored. You've got a better version of a host by just putting it out there, letting it stay out there by itself instead of killing it all the time. 
and starting over. I, I just love Ford kind of coming face to face with his own limitations. And I thought, I thought that that was a particularly beautiful scene. So we're going to end the podcast here with a question. Which character do you think you are most like? I'll start the, I'll start things off uh, just to get it started. Um, so there's a part of me that really wants to say I'm most like Bernard, right? Really wants to like myself that way. But I have to say, and if I'm at a party and I'm being honest, I'm, I'm kind of white hat William in, in the sense of always looking for someone to save. Um, except white hat, white hat William went a certain way with his failures. I think I went a different way with mine. Uh, I don't think I ended up anywhere near like a, a man in black, but I, I do find myself looking for causes. Let's just leave it at that. Um, so someone else can say who they think they're most like, or you can say things like, no, Scott, I mean, you're totally Bernard. What are you doing? And, and we can go on from there. So someone else volunteer. Who do you think you're most like? I'll jump in just because I'm kind of almost the opposite of what, uh, what you said, because I who I'd like to be and who I maybe am are two different things. And, you know, I kind of want to see more of Maeve, you know, that kind of confidence and whatnot. And I have the sarcasm and that's probably about it. Um, <laughs> but I actually see myself as more like Bernard and that, you know, I'm kind of, um, you know, I can be awkward at times. Mm. I'm, you know, but in the end, I come across as a pretty smart person, but in the end, I don't really know that I have that much control over my life. Mm, Everything is enough. just sort of, sort of out of my, out of my control, and that's that's you know. So, I feel Bernard, but then I don't know that I view that as the positive that you do. Oh, fair enough. Well, yeah, no, I, I, I look at Bernard, and it's interesting because there's just a, a ton of humility there. Um, now, it's humility, sort of wrought of self doubt, right? I mean, he's always not certain who he is, and there's just a pragmatic view about his own identity that just carries him through all the situations that looks like humility to me. Um, but in the end, I don't know, it may just be more self-doubt. I'm not sure. Um, who's next. You guys don't want to play this game. Huh? <laughs> when did I actually played this game before and we did it for each other. Right. So right. We, we both said who we thought the other was most like. All right. Well, we could do oh, it for an everybody. I'll, that's fine. I'll say who I think Sean is the most like, and then I don't know, Sean, if that's okay, you can, you can reciprocate. So um, th we just had this conversation earlier. We were standing in our kitchen. and um, I said, so what are you going to say when Scott asks this last question? And he said something like, well, who do you think I am? And I said, for sure, Bernard, because oh. Bernard is like super smart and he is very I, th I perceive him to be very calm in a crisis situation. Um, and he's got this kind of morality that I think is missing in a lot of the other characters. And I also feel like if I were going to trust the future of the world to a single person, I'd have to pick Sean. Cause I just think I, I, I like him a lot. <laughs> okay. Drop the mic game over. No one else is going to be able to compete with that at all. <laughs> How about you, Sean? Who is she? Who Who is Wynn? Definitely, uh, she's Maeve. I told her this. And it's not just because of all the F-bombs she drops. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of those. Yeah, but she's confident, um, compassionate. I mean, fierce. I mean, we've used the word fierce before, but she is fierce. Absolutely. Um, in a negotiation for more, for money for a book, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> He's amazing. All righty then. Leandra and Tara. I, so like I know, I think it's the same thing where like I see two characters that I think are kind of similar and I identify with both of them. One is me and self-doubt and the other is me when I'm feeling confident. Mm. So I actually really identify with Teddy uh, I feel mm. like I can be a little too soft-hearted and I'm gullible and when I have someone that I love or when I have a, a topic or a, an issue that I'm very passionate about, I tend to be very like, blinded to that and like very focused, um, which makes it easy to kind of just be like, oh, well, you need to do this. And I'm like, oh, okay, like I'll do that. 
But at the same time, there are times where I feel like I'm a lot like Stubbs, where it's very similar. Like I have this code to protect and I have a certain mission that I'm on, but I do it as a badass. Um, and when I'm done, I walk away. Like, all right, I achieved my mission and then and I'm done. I, I'm good to go. So I think I can just, I, for both of them, there have been times where they've said things where I'm like, I got you. Um, I don't want to end up like Teddy. Mm. So I'm going to try to be a little bit more like Stubbs. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Covered Tara? in dust in a bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> I do think I have Stubbs like morbid, dry humor. Like I could totally see myself being like, dude, I'm dying. Like, what do you want? Like, I don't. Like, just bring me some ice and a beer. I'm just saying, yeah, you put know, me in a bathtub and I'm good. Me. I'd be like, where's my Merlot? I'm out. <laughs> I totally get that vibe. You guys go fight about your apocalypse thing. Just, you know, leave me in this cheap motel. And I did my up. job. I'm out. <laughs> okay, Tara, it's come to you. Okay, I liked Charlotte. And I mm. felt like, especially... Um, Earlier, pre-kids, I was like, super just like driven and, you know, like, I'm going to, this is my goal and it's going to happen and, and, you know, sneaky when appropriate um, <laughs> <laughs> to get it done, yeah. right? right. Um, but also that vulnerability that we saw in Char Loris, mm -hmm. I think, um, especially since having kids, I've, I've seen a shift and even a shift away from um from from having that same super drive and i think we saw that in charloris where she realizes she has a family and she becomes more family oriented mm. and so yep and then that sets her up to uh become darth vader Which when that I, all gets taken from her if this pandemic continues like might be my trajectory <laughs> you know like <laughs> i don't know where things are going no <laughs> no, no, we don't at all. I don't think it's going to have Pink Floyd at the end of the soundtrack. So, uh, it's so in your world and mine. In your world. <laughs> so, does anyone have any kind of final comments about the show overall that they'd like to make? It's not uh, not required, but I wish I had a button like Bernard at a faculty meeting where I just could kick some ass for two minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you meant like garage or something like that. We called that the Hulk. What would we call it? The Hulk the button. Hulk. Yeah. yeah. Hulk, um, yeah Hulk. The garage door Hulk opener, button. that Hulk mode. That's what we call it. Okay, cool. Well, uh, that about wraps it up for us. So thanks to this wonderful collection of brilliant HBO Westworld fans for joining me in tonight's discussion. Panelists, please tell the audience where they can find you on social media. We'll start with Sean. Hi, uh, I'm on Twitter, Sean M. Stone 2. It used to be Sean M. Stone 1, but I forgot the password and I just created a different account. <laughs> So now, now there's just Sean Stone out, one out there just floating around. Yep. Tara, how about you? Uh, my name is Tara Rains, and I can be found at TC Rains 2. That's T C R A I N E S 2 on Twitter. Marty, how about you? Uh, you probably can't find me easily, but on Twitter, it's Marty underscore Lloyd. Uh, you can follow to see what contests I enter. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, they might want to reach out to you for Maeve lessons. You know, you, <laughs> you said you, <laughs> you wanted to be more like Maeve. Leandra, how about you? You can find me on Twitter at Paris Leandra at P A R R I S L E A N D R A. Okay. Wind? So I'm definitely in the minority. I don't really use social media um, for marketing. I I'm only have Facebook and I'm only friends with people on Facebook I know personally. Sure. So I'll say that if you want to find me, um, my recommendation would be to, um, you can just find my email by, I think I'm the only wind good friend in the world. <laughs> um, so you can just Google my name if you want to email me. But also I would encourage people to go to Amazon and look up my author page and you can mm. see the 16 books that I have listed on my page. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I'm on Twitter at Jordan Jam Party. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-J-A-M Party. Um, and you can find all episodes of Dark Loops, Why Is This So Good on YouTube at the Dark Loops Productions channel. If you'd like to leave feedback about this podcast, please leave it below on this YouTube channel or send a message to darkloopsproductions at gmail.com. 
Again, that's darkloopsproductions at gmail.com. We'll be sure to read it at the end of our next podcast. So there it is. From all of us to all of you, big hugs. And remember, these violent delights will have violent ends. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.